Now, Susanna Simons presents Business Daily. It's half past twelve. Thames, TVAM, TVS and TSW lose their franchises. Carlton takes over in London, Sunrise gets the early morning. Meridian beats TVS despite bidding lower and West Country beats TSW. Well, at 10 o'clock this morning, after five months of careful scrutiny, the Independent Television Commission finally delivered its eagerly awaited verdict. It means that four commercial television companies will lose their franchises at the end of next year. The losers are Thames Television, the early morning contractor TVAM, the troubled TVS, which covers southern England, and TSW, which covers the southwest. Under the new system introduced by the Broadcasting Act, incumbents and challengers had to submit their programme intentions and a detailed business plan for the 10 years from 1993 to the ITC. Applicants had to clear a programme quality threshold and say how much cash they were willing to pay annually for their licence. Well, we'll be hearing from three of the biggest winners and gauging the stock market's reaction in a moment. But we start with the ITC's announcement, which was faxed to the winners and losers just over two hours ago. The end of a five-month ordeal as the dreaded fax from the ITC to all the franchise bidders arrived just before 10 o'clock this morning. In this case, at London Weekend Television, enormous relief at the success of a bid pitched cheekily well below that of an only rival which failed to pass the quality threshold. But at a crowded press conference held at the ITC's headquarters in London's Knightsbridge, household names in television like Thames and TVAM were about to be stripped of their franchises. Four of the incumbent ITV licenses have not been awarded licenses. Eight of the 16 licenses have not gone to the applicant who on the 15th of May put the highest cash bid in the envelope. The ITC has not invoked exceptional circumstances and the Treasury will get more money but not much more. The main changes are in the south of England with incumbents losing the London weekday franchise, National Breakfast Time, South and South East England and the South West. For the London weekday licence, Carlton Communications outbid Thames with an offer of £43.2 million. At the time of the announcement, Thames was not revealing the size of its bid. For early morning television, the Sunrise Consortium, which includes The Guardian and LWT, outbid TVAM. Sunrise offered £34.6 million to TVAM's £14 million. In the south and southeast, Meridian, majority owned by the financial services group MAI, beat TVS with a bid of 36.5 million pounds. TVS offered nearly 60 million, but the ITC thought it would not be able to maintain its proposed service throughout the 10-year franchise period. The same reason saw TSW lose its franchise to West Country, owned by Associated Newspapers and Southwest Water, which bid 7.8 million, half the TSW bid. With Granada bidding just a quarter of the amount offered by its one rival, Northwest TV, but still retaining its franchise, and Central and Scottish confirming their unopposed bids of just £2,000, there were inevitable questions about whether some licenses had been sold on the cheap. Some may be thought to have got their licenses on the cheap. <coughs> However, you must not forget that the competitive tender is in two parts. The, the first, a percentage of annual qualifying revenue, set for the license period by the ITC, which is a reserve price, and the second is the cash bid. And for example, Central Independent Television have bid only £2,000, but they're also committed to paying 11% of their annual revenue to the Treasury. For today's winners, the franchise round now enters a new phase. The ITC expects to grant licenses, in each case within six weeks, and the new services have 14 months to get on air. For the losers, there's the doubtful last resort of seeking a judicial review of the ITC's decision. Well, dealers on the city's trading floors were all on tenterhooks first thing this morning as they counted down the minutes to the announcement. As soon as the results were known, shares in three of the losing incumbents promptly fell. Thames, however, saw an initial rise in its share price. Shares in the winners also rose. 
Susanna Antunes was on the floor of Smith New Court's dealing room as the screens flashed the news. The uncertainty which has afflicted the television sector ever since the government first said it would auction off the ITV franchises has wreaked havoc on the contractors' shares. Investors' attempts to anticipate the winners and losers sent some share prices soaring and others plummeting. For the media team at stockbroker Smith Newcourt this morning, the countdown to 10 o'clock was fraught. Last-minute rumours frayed the nerves of even the bravest, for they all knew that money would be made and lost on the unexpected. The stock exchange declared a fast market in the shares of the 30 companies involved and said that prices on the screens would be indicative only. That meant that market makers weren't obliged to buy or sell at their quoted prices until half an hour after the announcement, giving them time to digest the news. On the dot of 10, the winners and losers were duly flashed up on dealers' screens. It soon became apparent that not one of the winners was a surprise. But traders did soon spot the two revelations of the day. Both LWT and Granada had bid much less for their franchises than expected. The lack of surprises didn't hold back the dealers. Trading was hectic and the volume of shares dealt quickly grew as investors sought to correct their positions. Now, for many investors, it's a question of number crunching and working out the sums to see what they mean for both the winners and the losers. And in the last two hours, the financial, financial experts have had more time to take stock of what it all means for TV companies' share prices. So let's return to Smith Newcourt and find out what media analyst Nick Ward has learnt from his slide rule. So Nick, what have you learnt in the last couple of hours? Well, I don't think there's a great deal more that we've learnt in the last two hours in that it was actually fairly predictable. Um, the bids very much were in line with what was expected and what Ray Snoddy of the Financial Times was predicting. The only two major anomalies were London Weekend Television, which, which bid only around 8 million against the 40 that was expected, and Granada, which bid about 10 against the 20 that was expected. Now, the three losers fell, or three of the losers fell, Thames didn't. Why is that? I think people feel that Thames, more than any other company, has a future as an independent production company. And I think that's a correct appraisal. Thames Television unquestionably has a very big portfolio of, of um, very good programs. And indeed, it, more than Granada, actually sell into the old network a higher proportion of highly rated programs. So I think it's got a good future ahead of it, and I think the price is reflecting that. I think it's reflecting more that than the actual breakup value of the company. And just briefly, has the turnover continued or not, or is the enthusiasm petering out a bit now? I think it's petering out a bit. We saw gyrations early on in share prices. I think they've settled down. Thames, curiously enough, rose ahead of the announcement, then came back to around the 190 level, where it still is. Nick, thank you. Well, as well as looking at applicants' programming intentions, the ITC has had to analyse their business plans and make sure that the financial assumptions are sound. The man who headed up the ITC's team scrutinising the finances is its Deputy Chief Executive and Director of Finance, Peter Rogers. A short while ago, I asked him whether the quality threshold had applied to the bidders' business plans as well as their programmes. Yes, it did. The quality threshold is in, is in three parts, actually. Uh, programming, finance and engineering standards. And were you at any stage of the game then worried that those who bid too much and therefore didn't get their franchises might have bid so much that it would affect the quality of the programmes? Well, we haven't and uh, we aren't prepared to give reasons as to uh, why people uh, didn't, uh, didn't win. But in, in three cases, we've made it clear that the reason for the decision is that they didn't pass the, that part of the quality threshold which relates to the business plan as opposed to programmes. Now, presumably all the business plans are based on the assumption that advertising revenue will grow at a certain rate. What happens if we recover from the recession slower than everybody is thinking, and that doesn't happen and the revenue doesn't come in? Yes, it is true that uh, all of the applicants, the losers too, I think, expected to see uh, the end to the present recession and some growth uh, during the 10-year during the ten, the ten period. Uh, the, the tender is in two parts. The first part of the tender, called the percentage of qualifying revenue, is a percentage of essentially turnover. Uh, and then, but the figure that actually decides the, the award is the cash bid. 
the important thing about that first part is that uh, if the revenue doesn't come up to expectations, then the size of that obligation moves in, in, in step with revenue. So that's a, that's a great help to the system, and that's why we're always very keen to, uh, to, to have a substantial amount there. Well, of course, you've ended up with bids ranging from £1,000 to £70 million. Do you think with hindsight something could have been done to even that up? I don't. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, as you say, I mean, uh, central is a is, is is a case. I think that's uh, probably on many people's lips today with a very small cash bid. But do remember that central will have to pay in the first part of the tender 11 percent of its revenue from the first pound onwards. So it will have a lot of money to pay. Well, the biggest upset this morning was the news that the long-time incumbent Thames had lost its franchise to Carlton TV. Jane Alexander asked Nigel Wormsley of Carlton whether he could make money out of the franchise. Our business plan is firmly based on um, the objective of running a profitable broadcasting service and uh, we are very confident that that's achievable. You've actually paid more than any other successful applicant though, so aren't you finding, going to find it harder than your competitors to make money? Well, first of all, you have to remember that, that uh, we uh, have been offered the licence for the largest re region, so pro rata. I doubt very much whether we've paid more than, uh, than other broadcasters. Um, secondly, uh, the structure of our business, which is that of a publisher broadcaster, that is to say commissioning programs from independents rather than making them ourselves, has enabled us to design a business which has a leaner overhead. We are not in any way skimping on financial resources for programs. Our program plans will be fully funded on a very significant scale. But we intend to be efficient um, in terms of limiting the overhead cost because at the end of the day that overhead cost is not productive, it's not what the viewers see on the screen um, and that must therefore be our priority. How long do you think it will be before this makes a contribution to Carlton's profits? Our business plan is based on uh, our broadcasting service being profitable in the first year of operation in 1993. Your success is obviously going to mean the loss of jobs at Thames Television. How many people is Carlton actually going to employ? Overall, we'll be employing between about 350 and 400 people because, as I've said, the majority of the programme making will be commissioned from independent production companies. I would very much hope that they would see an expansion in the numbers employed in the independent sector. Uh, but we ourselves will be employing fewer people than are currently employed at Thames Television. Another celebrator this morning was MAI, the majority shareholder of the, of the Meridian Consortium, which has wrested the South and Southeast franchise from TVS. MAI has 61% of Meridian, with minority shares held, held by Central and Select TV. Joanne Hart asked MAI Managing Director Lord Hollick why he thought Meridian had won, given that it bid nearly £20 million less for the franchise than TVS. The ITC have made it very clear that there are two elements to the franchise process. One is quality of programmes, and the other is quality of business plan, quality of money, quality of management, if you like. And I think they've made it very clear that you had to pass on both tests. And I think uh, there's always been some doubt from independent observers about uh, the, uh, a very high bid being, sustain, being able to sustain uh, programming across the 10-year period. So I think that was the issue. When do you actually expect to reap profits from this bid? Well, the business should be profitable uh, from the uh, very early months and we would expect that uh, MAI's first full year, that's the year to uh, June 1994, will uh, show a profit from uh, this activity. Can you give me any guidance as to how well, much? I, we've just had to make a 10-year forecast to the ITC of revenues. I'm certainly not going to be drawn into a forecast of profits for uh, three years hence. Do you not think, though, that the whole bidding situation has been rather farcical? I think we'll have to wait and see how uh, the uh, programmes and the companies work out over the next five and ten years. Uh, certainly, uh, the ITC and the legislation uh, did give the ITC uh, some uh, leeway, did give them some discretion so that they were able to choose uh, companies which combined programme and quality with quality of business plan. I think if uh, Possibly I've been doing it, uh, and auctioning off uh, such a valuable asset, I think I'd put a reserve price on it. You, you say that you can't give any specific guidance as to how much profits you may make from this, winning this bid, but would you say that it'll be a substantial percentage of the profits that you currently make? I think we see broadcasting as a major new profit area for us. We have obviously have our own uh, high expectations of rates of return for the investment we've made, and we're sure that we can achieve those.
And one of the heavyweights of the existing television landscape is London Weekend Television, which has held the London license for the past 23 years. This morning's news that LWT has retained the franchise with a bid of £7.8 million sent celebrations starting throughout the building. Well, with me I have the chairman of LWT, Christopher Bland. So, Mr Bland, first of all, you bid quite low. Do you think at any stage in the game you were taking a risk? Yes, uh, the whole process was immensely risky, but we took no greater risk bidding what we bid than if we'd bid at the upper limit of our own calculations, which was round about the 28 to 32 million mark. In the event, of course, you passed on the quality threshold, and there again, it's such a nebulous quality that there must have been doubts, wasn't there? Well, plainly there are doubts. It was an uncertain process, and that's why, in the end, it was such an odd uh, way of selecting winners and losers. But we took the view, on the one hand, that we had a very high quality program offering ourselves, and we took the view, in the end, rightly, that our opponents were, relatively speaking, weak, and were unlikely to pass the quality threshold. But we also thought that if they did, we have a strong chance of getting exceptional quality. And we felt that the bid at the level we put in gave the ITC the best uh, incentive, if it was necessary, to give us exceptional circumstances. In the end, that turned out not to be necessary. But it was a relatively low bid. Does that mean you have concerns about the rate of recovery in terms of advertising revenue? No. Uh, we could have bid more, but we decided that uh, the best way of uh, winning was to bid at the level we did and also of ensuring that this company continued to have a really strong and prosperous future. If we'd bid at our outer limit, we would have been stretched for the next 10 years. We've just gone through a massive program of reorganization and redundancy. We have half the workforce that we had four years ago, and we're now able to look, and look to the future with confidence and plan ahead. Now, you're also in involved in the Sunrise Consortium, which, of course, has got the early morning franchise. Bruce Gingell has already said that you've bid too much and you'll go bust by 1994 and won't be able to make the right quality programmes. Do you think he's right? Obviously, I don't. <laughs> we'll see about that. But uh, we have a group of pretty hard-headed shareholder, uh, shareholders involved who know a lot about television ourselves, Guardian, the Manchester Evening News Group, Scottish Television and Disney. And we all looked at the numbers and agreed that this was a sensible amount to bid. You have to remember two things, that unlike TVAM, we will be producing the program out of an existing set of studios, which we're sitting in now, or in the building now. And secondly, we don't have to be, or expect to be, as profitable as TVAM was. Mr. Brown, thank you. Well, that's all for part one. Coming up after the break, the government's finances slide further into the red as the September public sector borrowing requirement balloons to nearly three billion pounds. And motor insurance premiums undergo their biggest shake-up for years. That's in a couple of minutes. Stay with us and we'll see you then. And don't move.